Welcome to America's Top Rebbitons. May this class be for Rafu Shalema for Efrat Bar Orit. If you'd like to sponsor a podcast, please email us at atrebitsons at gmail.com. I'm so happy to have on today's show, Rebitson Gitti Blotner. Rebitson Gitti is a beloved educator and the director of the Chabad Hebrew School in Mesa, Arizona. She has a master's degree in education also. Rebitson Gitti is a spiritual mentor for many women in Arizona and beyond. Thank you so much for being here. Please tell us more about yourself and what you do. Hi, Vera. Um, I live in a city called Mesa in Arizona. It's the third largest city in Arizona. And Arizona is a beautiful state. It's known for the five C's, um, that being citrus, cattle. We have a tremendous amount of cattle. We have cotton, copper, and last but not least, we have unbelievable climate. Um, we also live in a valley. So our city has mountains jutting out all around with beautiful hikes all around it. And it's a beautiful destination. So whenever you can come visit us, especially in the winter. Oh, for sure. It sounds so beautiful. And if you're watching this on Facebook, it looks beautiful. They have palm trees in the background. <laughs> yes. And okay. um, we live in Mesa and we have built up a Jewish community from bottom up in Mesa. And we have all kinds of programs um, reaching out to all the different ages because our goal is to reach every single Jew. So we have mommy and me's. We have children's clubs, teen clubs, we have adult education classes, we have programs reaching out to the seniors, and hopefully, you know, our goal is that every single Jew should be able to be reached and be touched by the beauty of Judaism. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for being here. I want to get right into right into Torah. Um, I know that one of the things that you're passionate about is the important role of Jewish women. Women are so precious in the eyes of Hashem, in the eyes of God. He loves us and he values us so, so much. Could you please talk to us about where women stand in the eyes of Hashem? Sure. Um, I want to point out three um, beautiful points that speak to me. The first point is, is that when... Um, a human being creates something, he has to gather all his materials and from the materials he gathers, he's going to create something. So if I'm making a cake, I'm gonna gather my flour, my eggs, my sugar and make my cake. If I'm building a building, I'm gonna gather my wood and my sheet rack and my paints and my materials and then I will build my building. As opposed to God or Hashem, when he uh, created the world, he created something from nothing. Hashem just said there shall be a world and the world became. and and the, the interesting thing was, is that God gave woman the power closest to this godly ability of his to create something from nothing, because women are the only ones who are able to, um, to create, nurture, and bring a child into, into the world. And if we think of it, of how a, ch a child came about, it's really the closest thing to creating something from nothing. And that is an ability that Hashem gave to the Jewish woman, to, to all women, women across the, across the globe. That's, that's number one. Number two, as Jewish woman, um, God gave Jewish women the ability to pass down the essence to their children. And what I mean by that is, is that if we, women are the only ones that are able to pass down their Jewishness to their children. If a mom is Jewish, her child is Jewish. Not that, our fa the, uh, that the father doesn't contribute to the child, not that the ch father is not involved in the child. A father passes down his identity within the Jewish people to his child because a child belongs to his father's shevitz, to his father's tribe. So within the Jewish people, a father gives him the identity as to where the child stands within the Jewish people. But the essential ability to be a Jew is passed down only through a mother. It's only a, something that a Jewish mother can give a child. So that's something very, very special that Hashem has given to the Jewish mother, the ability just by being the Jewish mother to pass on to her children. And the third point that I want to make is a quote from, um, from King Shlomo, which we say every Friday night as we begin the Shabbos meal. King Solomon said, Ashes Chayel Ateret Bala. A woman of valor is the crown of her husband. And there's, there's two interesting points that I want to make a crown, about a crown. Number one is a crown is, the, uh, is what distinguishes royalty. 
when you see a crown or on a king or a queen's head, we understand that there's royalty here before us. And the second point that I want to make about a crown is, is that it's something that is at the top of the head and it surrounds the head. Mm -hmm. And um, so I want to take those two points and I want to tell you that in the spiritual spheres, there is a level on high and it's called Keter, Keser, the crown. Yes. And the energies that are drawn down from this spiritual place on high called Keter are very, very lofty energies. They're energies that actually surround us just the way a crown surrounds a head. And the reason that they surround us is because those energies are so, so very lofty. They're there to surround us and protect us, but they're not necessarily absorbed into us. They just they just hover around us. And the example that, that I like to give is that when we get a package, you know, that's 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 important. It usually will come, in, you know, bubble wrapped. Yes. What's what's the point of the bubble wrap? It's there to protect you. It surrounds the the, the object, and it's going to protect that object in in shipping. And so too, this is the energies that are drawn down from this holy level called keter or keser. It's very very lofty energies that surround us and protect us just like a crown that surrounds the head of, of royalty of a, uh, of a king or a queen. And in a more practical level, the energies that are drawn down from the level of Keter is the abilities to have faith. And Hashem and King, Sol King Solomon was saying is that what brings out the beauty, the greatness of, of, a, of a family, what is the crown of a husband what is it? It's his Aisha's Chayil. It's his wife. The, the ability for her to bring the faith that she brings into the home, that is going to bring the, be the distinguishing beauty um, that, that the woman brings toward to the family. So those are three um, interesting points of Hashem's view of, um, of women and specifically Jewish women. That's so beautiful. I love that. It's really, really beautiful. And it shows just how special women are in the eyes of Hashem. And it's so important, in, in, you know, to a husband and in the role of a family. And I want to dive a little bit deeper into that. So I'm going to, you know, say that Hashem created women with a Bina Yaseira. We have, we all women have that extra little bit of intuition that men just don't have. Having Bina is very important for a woman. I mean, it allows her to sense what her husband and what her children really and truly need. Women are able to read in between the lines and understand the unspoken. And this quality helps them to be better wives and better mothers. Can you please explain to us a little bit more about what Bina Yesera is and how women can use this gift in their lives? Sure. Um, so the, the first thing I want to point out is, is that there's different, there's different modes of thinking, which is today recognized within science. But within Kabbalah, it's broken down as the first mode of thinking is called Chachma, which in English is translated as wisdom. And it's, it's the initial cognitive ability that a human being has. And it's, it's, it's compared to lightning in Kabbalah, like when lightning strikes, it's just like this big light that just shines through the sky and it sort of lights up the sky. Or when, or when we say in English, like the, you know, the light bulb went off in my head. And that's the concept of the Chachma. That's the first like spark, uh, you know, intellectual spark that a person has towards a certain concept. But that first intellectual spark is not necessarily enough to, to bring an idea to fruition. So it, um, well, after the first step of the first bright idea that enters our mind, we have to then go and develop that idea. So in Kabbalah, that's called Bina. In English, we would call it the understanding or the developing of a concept. So it's great to have a great idea, but then we have to take a look at it in many different angles. We have to de develop the idea. We have to um, see it from many, many different angles and see what we need to do to actually bring that idea to fruition. Well, the ability of Bina is the ability that, that is going to develop that idea and, and make it make it happen. So if, let's say I want to plan a birthday party. I say, oh, you know, I want to make my husband a surprise birthday party. So that first flash is called Chachma or the wisdom. And then I have to start planning that concept. How's it going to be a surprise? Who am I inviting? What's going to be the theme? What's going to be the food? What am I going to do? How am I going to make sure he's not going to know it? So the constant development of that idea is, is the idea of, of understanding or Bina. And the truth is, is that every single human being hopefully many times throughout the day, uses their abilities of wisdom and their abilities of understanding or their ability of chachma or their ability of bina 
everybody needs that to bring an idea to fruition, whatever that idea may be. Um, but, but our sages said that women have that extra measure of Bina, that extra measure of understanding, that extra measure of the ability to to reach out and really touch the details of a concept of, of, of concepts. And of course, men have been a two, but women have that very extra measure and it develops so many ideas. Women are the ones who enjoy making the home beautiful in most cases. They have that extra sense to understand that I need that little extra beautiful vase on, on that mantle to really make it look nice. Women are the one, it's because they have that extra measure of being or that extra measure of wisdom, they have the ability to tune in and s smell out when something, even though maybe somebody didn't say something in the family, that maybe something's not right. Maybe they should probe a little deeper. Maybe we should see what's going on. Is everything okay in my child's class? Is everything okay with my husband at work? Should, should we you know, take a look? Should we probe? Should we see if there's different ideas? That's the extra bina that a woman has, that she has the ability to probe into ideas um, more deeply. And the, the third step is, is that when you de develop something within yourself and you deal with it a lot, you develop a feeling towards that thing or sympathy or empathy. So that creates a, a great measure of a, a greater ability to have a greater measure of sympathy or empathy towards the people around you or the ideas that you're dealing with because we have that greater uh, ability to really um, develop that idea from many, many different angles. And that's something that Hashem gave the, gave the Jewish woman, that ability Hashem gave to the Jewish woman to really be able to be the mainstay of their home, the Akaris bias of their home. That's beautiful. Yes. And it's very, very important because women, you're right. Women really hold the home together. They, they know when to probe a little further, when to investigate, when there's, they really know that there's a problem with the kid, even if the husband doesn't pick up on it, when to know there's an issue with her husband, something underlying, when it's not overt, when it's not obviously said, exactly. she knows she has that in her. Exactly. And that's really the extra measure of the Bina that Hashem has given to, to the woman. Exactly, exactly. And um, speaking of men and women, I mean, Hashem created roles for both men and women. And although those roles are different, maybe even because they are different, it is so important for women to feel strong and confident in themselves and not to feel subservient to men. Women set the tone in the home, as we were saying, and it's even said that the woman is her husband's home. What yes. advice can you give to women who might feel inferior to men in order to encourage them to be proud Jewish women? Okay, so I'm going to turn again to King Solomon <laughs> and to Shlomo HaMelech. And in Proverbs, in Mishle, he said, Ezehu Isha Keshera Ha'isera which means, who is a virtuous woman? One who does the will of her husband. Um, it, at, at face value, that might sound like a, for a woman to be a virtuous woman, to be a good wife, to be, to be who she's supposed to be, that she, she does have to be subservient to her husband. So it seems on face value. But, you know, our holy tongue is, is an amazing language. It's Hashem's language. It's God's language. So ha the one who does or one fulfills, it could mean one who does or one fulfills, but ha can also mean one who creates. Interesting. So mm -hmm. on face value, it, it does mean that who is a virtuous woman, one who does the will of her husband. As long as you do what your husband asks of you, then you're a virtuous woman. But on a deeper level, in, in the Hebrew language, is who is a virtuous woman? It's the one who creates the will of her husband. She is the one that is a virtuous woman. What, what does that mean that she creates the will of her husband? You know, we all hope and, you know, we married the right person and our goals in life are hopefully very similar and our husband has, has, has a, a healthy worldview, but we're all human beings. And at times, um, our spouses might have a worldview or an attitude and an idea that's maybe not the best idea. What does King Solomon say? that you have the ability to create the will or the worldview or the attitude of your husband, that it should be the right idea without compromising his feeling of being the man of the house. That's what it means. Who is a virtuous woman? She's going to create the will of her husband. And I want to tell you a story from the Talmud. It's a little bit of an extreme story, but sometimes from the extreme, we, we can learn the lesson 
in situations, hopefully in our situations, in a healthy situation, but we can learn lessons from it. And the story from the Talmud is, is that there was once um, a marriage set up between, I guess, an Isha Kashera, a virtuous Jewish woman, and she was set up with a wonderful young man, a Torah scholar who was from another city. And the wedding day came and um, the, the groom arrived and the wedding was prepared by the bride's family and there was a beautiful wedding. But soon after the wedding, the rabbis of the city realized that it is that the, the man that this young woman married it is impossible that he is the person that she was set up to marry. And soon a news came to them that it seems that the that the groom, as he was traveling to, to you know, to, to his wet to his wedding, that he was that he was murdered, oh and gosh. it seemed to them that probably the the murderer took his identity and his clothing, and he came with 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 the groom's identity and presented himself as the groom and married this wonderful young woman. And the, the rabbis who married her off were waiting for this young woman to come to the rabbis to ask for a divorce. But she didn't come. And finally, they decided, you know, if she's not going to come to us, we must go to her. So the rabbis came towards her home. And she sees the rabbis of her city coming towards her home. And she went and she placed something in the window. What did she place in the window? She placed a menorah with a rotten piece of wood on top of the menorah. And when the rabbis saw that, they turned around and they left her. Because by placing that menorah with that rotten piece of wood, she was actually sending a message to the rabbis. She's saying that a menorah ha has the ability to burn and make bright even a wood, wood that is rotten. That's not a good piece of wood. And in her case, that's eventually what happened. She changed the will of this husband. And in her case, it was a very extreme situation. Obviously, her husband was a very, very not good man. He was obviously, but but she changed his will. Uh, my, uh, you know, God forbid if somebody's in an extreme situation, I'm not saying that you should stay in that marriage, but if it's in a healthy situation where it's something here and something there and our husbands don't necessarily have the worldview in a very quiet way with the, our extra bina, our extra, uh, you know, our extra level of understanding that God gave us with that extra measure of faith that God gave the Jewish woman. The Jewish woman has the ability to very quietly find a way to change her husband's will or change his view or change his attitude in life. And that's something that every, every Jewish woman has the ability to do. And she needs to just find the right tools to do it. It's so amazing. I love that story. It's such a powerful story. And you're right. Like it was an extreme story, but I like, I like that. Sometimes when you have an extreme story, it really, really highlights the message and the purpose. So you can really see it. It illuminates and then you can um, relate it back to your own life. I love it. Thank you so much for sharing that. That was awesome. That was really great. <laughs> um, but yeah. um, I, I, I want to tell you further is that my, Maimonides writes, writes, um, writes, writes the Rambam, he writes as the laws between a husband and, ma and a wife. And he writes something very interesting. He says, a wife, sh a wife should honor her, honor her husband greatly. Mm -hmm. So what it means by honoring your husband greatly is that doesn't mean that today she should decide, does my husband deserve that I should honor him or he doesn't deserve to honor him. That means that a woman should honor his, her husband greatly. Even if maybe today's a day that inside of myself, I feel like he really doesn't deserve that I should be on, honoring him, but still I should honor him greatly. And in, to, in Tehillim, it says, Kamayim hapanim el panim. That means our, our face is reflected by the water. The way I'm going to treat my husband, hopefully if it's a, uh, more or less a healthy situation, that's going to be reflected back to me. And I see brilliance in that. Maimonides saying is if I honor my husband greatly, if I honor him in a way that maybe he deserves a greatness, maybe he doesn't deserve the greatness today, but what's going to happen? It's, go it's going to reflect back. It's just going to cause a healthy situation all around. And, and hopefully that the treatment is going to come, you know, come back to me that I'm going to be treated respectfully and honored by by my husband too but on that note i also want to say it's not like the husband's scotch-free maimonides talks to the husband and tells him that a man should honor his wife more than himself and love her as much as he loves himself but the interesting thing is is that he you know he tells the woman that he, that that she should honor her man greatly 
Yes. But when a woman when a woman has the ability to honor her man greatly, even if perhaps he doesn't deserve it, it helps bring a healthier situation into the home. That's beautiful, right? Because so if there is um, you know, strife or arguments or something like that by a woman honoring her husband, she can kind of help to smooth it over because I really do. I also agree with you. I feel like uh, men, men need respect. Like they do like just, that's just something that, that men need for what that's just how Hashem created men that they need respect. And if a woman gives a man respect, sometimes once he has that, he'll soften a little bit and he'll be able to give the woman the love that she needs and the care and appreciation that she needs. But I think sometimes, sometimes not in all situations, but sometimes a man needs to have that respect first or to feel the security that his wife respects him. I think it's really important. I think you're right. Right. And, and the example that I, that I like to give is, is that if we, if we went to a ballet or we went to a show and we see the beautiful costumes and the actors and the music and everything is played out so beautifully and everybody did a great job. But at the end of the day, there's one person that we don't see. And that person is probably the one that's responsible for, for everything running smoothly in that show. And that's the, that's the director of the play or the ballet or whatever it may be. That person is not seen, but that director is the one that made sure that everybody knows exactly what to do and everybody knows where to be and everybody knows their parts and every, everything should be running smoothly. And that's the director. And in many times I, I look at that as I, I see the woman of the home being in that role. We do need to make our husbands feel like he's the man of the house, but we have to remember that we're the directors of that home. We're the one that's going to make him feel like a man and be like a man and the man is going to hopefully step into his role the way he's supposed to and we're going to see to it that, that the home is healthy that you know the children the family everybody's growing up in a, in a healthy home and has to start from the top it has to be a healthy you know it has to be a healthy relationship with the parents on top and when it's healthy on top hopefully it'll you know it comes down that also there's a healthy environment and home for everybody involved the children that are involved in the home so if we can look at ourselves as directors who are directing that you know everybody should be in the, the right place should feel the right should feel the right thing should should be in the right place should be able to do the right thing it's, it's an awesome task that that women have and it's the abilities that Hashem gave us and Hashem gave us those abilities with that extra measure of faith and and the extra measure of wisdom and we do have that ability to to make it happen amen I love it <laughs> I love it um so women are in a unique position where they can really make their voice heard and their actions matter um there have been so many women in the Torah and in Jewish history who have made significant contributions toward our nation can you talk about maybe one or two Jewish women who have made a significant significant impact on our world so that we can learn from their example and be inspired to set our own example? Sure. Um, I would love to start with the first Jewish woman, our mother, Sarah. And I must say that, you know, many of the great women and men in, in the Torah, they, they have titles. Like our mothers, they're all called our mothers. Our four mothers are called the mothers of the Jewish people. That means that there's a certain significance to them being called the mothers of the Jewish people. They were also righteous women and virtuous women, but somehow the name, the, the title that, that has been attached to them by, by Jewish generations throughout has been the mothers of the Jewish people. So we have to take a look at that title. What does that mean, the title, mother? That means a mother passes on the DNA to her children, to, to the next generations after her. That means that our mothers... Who, the people who we call our mothers, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah, they passed on spiritual DNA to every single Jewish woman that comes after them. So if we take a look at the life of, of Sarah and, and, we, and we see what went on in the life of Sarah, I want to take a look at one or two stories in her life. One story that we, we know is that she and her husband, Abraham, Abraham, came to the land of Canaan. And soon after they had to leave because there was a famine in the country. And they went to the land of Egypt and the land of Egypt wasn't exactly a moral country. And the Pharaoh decided that he, you know, desired, had desired Sarah. And there in the Torah, it says is that the Egyptians were good to her, to Abraham because of Sarah, because they knew that he was related to, to Sarah. And over there, based on those words, the Talmud in, in Bava Metziah says that a man should be uh, diligent to honor his wife because blessings is found in a person's home solely in the merit of his wife, which means based on, on those words in the Torah, the Talmud derives that all the blessings in the home comes 
in the merit of the woman of the home. We learned that from Sarah. Beautiful. We can go down to our next mother, Rivka, and we know when she, she joined, you know, the family of the Jewish mothers, it says that three miracles, uh, the three miracles that existed in the time when her mother-in-law, Sarah, was alive, returned when, when Rivka came into, into Sarah's tent. And those three miracles were, is that when Rivka lit her candles Friday night, the candles continued burning until a week later, until it was time for her to light the candles again. There was also the, um, there was also the challah that, that she baked used to stay fresh and warm an entire week as if it just came out of the oven. And the third miracle that happened is that there was a cloud, the Shekhinah of Hashem was hovering over, over her tent. And those three miracles actually represent three mitzvahs that were really entrusted to the Jewish woman to make a proper and healthy home. It represents the mitzvahs of, the mitzvah of candles represents Shabbos. Of course, everybody contributes and makes Shabbos happen in the home. But the one who's like, who the responsibility truly rests on their shoulders, it's usually the Jewish woman who really pulls it together and makes Shabbos happen in the home. And that's represented by the mitzvah of the Shabbos candles. And the challah, the bread, is represented by the mitzvah of kashrus. I mean, of course, there are men that cook and sometimes children that cook, and it's great. But who's in charge of the kitchen? It's usually the woman of the home. And <laughs> the cloud, and the cloud represents family purity, the, um, to keep a, um, a, a holy family by going to mikvah at the right time in the month is represented by Hashem Shechina, by the cloud that brings godliness into, into the marriage, into the home into the home of, of this couple. And these, these miracles were, were open miracles that represented these three mitzvahs that, that, that Rivka and then before her, 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 her mother-in-law Sarah kept. And our, our sages have said that by them, the miracles was blatant. But in a spiritual sense, every single Jewish woman has the ability. Every single woman Every Jewish woman has the ability to bring the warmth of Shabbat into her home and that the beauty of Shabbat should last throughout the entire week. Every single woman has that ability to bring the blessings that are drawn down by keeping kosher and by, by keeping a, a family purity into her home, even though maybe we don't see physical miracles, but because we call these women our mothers, we have that ability to spiritually bring those blessings into, um, into our homes. And then, right. of course, we, we could take a look at um, we can take a look at Rachel, who came, who comes afterwards, and we know Yirmiya, the prophet says, "Kol Barama, a voice is heard on high." Of Rachel, she's she's begging ha uh, Hashem to be to be kind to her children, and Rachel, I would say, she had tremendous mesirut nefesh. She had the ability to give up to give up so much she was buried at the side of the road as they were traveling and today you know it's a major destination but at that time she was just buried at you know an isolated place on the road and and you know later even when when her son joseph yosef asked his father please allow me to uh to move my mother's my mother's uh coffin to you know to the cave of Mach, to the cave of Machpelah where all the other forefathers and mothers are buried her, his father explained to him no your mother needs to be where she is because when the Jewish people went into exile and they saw her her gravestone they cried to her and Rachel went and cried on high and and, and cried to Hashem and she said to Hashem what are you doing like why why are you sending the Jewish children into exile why are you sending your children into exile and the truth is is that it wasn't only Rachel all the great sages beforehand went clamoring to God and said, why are you sending the Jewish children to exile? What are you doing? And God didn't want to listen to anybody. They say, he said, you know, my children have brought, you know, are serving idols. They're not doing what they're supposed to. And this is what I'm doing. But when Rachel came and cried to God, she said, what, are you getting hysterical that your children, you know, are serving a few idols? I, I, allowed, I allowed another woman into my marriage. I allowed, you know, my sister lay into the marriage. And and, and you're like crying of a, a few pieces of metal and wood that your children are bowing to. And when God heard Rachel, he actually, he actually said, you know what, Rachel, you're right. You're right. I, I'm just letting my anger out on the stones. And, you know, the, the, you know, the Jewish people will, will I, I will make sure that they will return from exile. So we learn from her to have a tremendous amount of devotion and dedication to the point where, you know, she, she gave up a tremendous amount. So hopefully we don't have to come to that point, but, 
as Jewish mothers, many, many times there is a tremendous amount that maybe we do have to pass up for the time being, maybe when our children are young, maybe it's our talents, maybe it's our abilities that have to sort of be put on hold for a while, or we cannot be so actively involved in maybe projects that we want to be, but that's that we, we, we learn from our mother Rachel, that sometimes there has to be that tremendous devotion to really bring our families and the Jewish people to, to the place where they have to be. And then of course we learn from our mother Leah, you know, when the Torah says that, uh, Um, so I wanted to thank you so much for, for talking to us a little bit about the, the women in the Torah and our, our imahot, our, the mothers of the Jewish people. And I just wanted to ask you if there's anything that women can do practically in their lives, if they're stuck in a hard spot, if they're having difficulty in their relationship or in their homes, something practical that they can implement. Sure. Um, a few thoughts is this, in the ethics of our fathers, it says, that everybody should make for themselves a guide. So having someone to talk to and knowing that that person's in place to talk to and that person's in place and that when you have a hard situation coming up, you know who to turn to can be very helpful. And sometimes it could be a person, but sometimes, uh, may, sometimes it just, uh, ha maybe it could just be developing the inner abilities that, that, that Hashem has given all of us. Maybe it's by taking a class on, you know, on, on family dynamics or child rearing or reading a good book or, 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 or studying a little bit and how to bring our innate abilities that God has given us to be the mainstay of our home and to be the crowns of our, of our, of, of our homes. If sometimes it's just, we just need to bring forth the, the tools and the techniques that, that we need to really do the best that we can. That's one thought. And the next words right after that says, and acquire for yourself a friend. So sometimes maybe we should look around and see who are the people am I hanging, hanging around with? Are the women that I socialize with, do they, are they comfortable in their skins as Jewish women? Are they women that um, have a positive attitude towards their Jewish womanhood? And if, if maybe we don't have such a woman, such a, a person as a friend, maybe look around and find some, someone that seems to, to fit that role and, you know, make a coffee date with her, maybe make a, you know, play date with your children and maybe make her a friend that will, uh, that, that will be. A um, thirdly, I think that the power of, of prayer, the power of davening is, uh, is a very, is a very powerful tool. If, if situations are difficult to us, to offer up a prayer to Hashem is a very, very powerful tool. It sometimes has the ability to really change what's destined from us. And we actually learn that from our mother, Leah, who was actually able to change her destiny through prayer, through davening. Um, it doesn't have to be a long prayer. It could be in your own words, a special time. It could be maybe when you're lighting Shabbos candles, maybe when you get into the car for carpool, just to maybe if you know one one uh, chapter of Tehillim by heart and say it in honor of your family, just something quick and easy that you know that you're offering up a prayer to God for the sake of your family, if, that, if that's all that you can do. And lastly, if you have the ability, if you have to take a little bit of time for Torah, to learn Torah, Torah is a, a holistic form of healing. It's the wisdom of Hashem, it's the wisdom of God. And when we study Torah, we cause that our minds should really think in a more holistic, healthy attitude, the way God really intended it to be. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the subject, you know, on hand, which is, you know, family dynamics or family relationships, because it's, it's just a holistic um, uh, form of health. So if you have time for a Torah class or to read a good book on, on Torah knowledge or to listen to a great Torah podcast, that's amazing. But even if you only have the time, maybe even to read a Jewish story, maybe to your children at bedtime, that's also Torah knowledge. That also imbues us with like a, a love and appreciation for Judaism and who we truly are. So those are some thoughts of um, ideas out there for us to support us and guide us in really truly being, you know, the best Jewish woman that we could possibly be. 
and finally, I just want to really say that um, if if we are in a situation where perhaps maybe it really is, or maybe we even feel perhaps like you know we, we don't have the ability to really be the best we can be, we should just know that um, you know our our sages have said that when the times of Mashiach comes, that the feminine energy will. Uh, Will rule will, will guide the world today there's there's a masculine energy that guides the world but when the times of mashiach will come the feminine energy what a woman brings forth to the world the world will run in that will run in that form and slowly we're you're seeing that it's already happening the idea of inclusiveness not me the idea of sympathy empathy understanding another person the greater a, a, a great level of faith is slowly seeping into the world. So these ideas that really are the, the highlight of the greatness of a Jewish woman, those concepts, and according to those energies, the world will run when Mashiach comes. So I hope that, you know, we can make that in our own mini home. We can make that happen even before the coming of Mashiach. But of course, last but not least, that, you know, Mashiach should actually come, that the whole world will function on, on the feminine mode. I mean, of thank inclusiveness you. and loving and empathy and understanding that the Jewish woman bring forth to our homes and our marriages. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for articulating so beautifully the importance of the role of the Jewish woman and how proud we should all be to be Jewish women because we, we really do have the power to accomplish so, so much. We really do. Um, thank you so much, Rabbitson Gitti, for taking the time to join us on America's Top Rabbitsons. We really loved having you here. And may all the learning that we did today be for Rafua Shalema, for Efrat Bat Ori. Thank you so, so much. Amen. Amen. Thank you.